gentlemen, thanks for coming along tonight. We're delighted to see you all be joined by Lord Jonathan Sachs, who is the Chief Rabbi of the UK Commonwealth. He's written several books, and I've worked with him now, appears frequently in the media and advises the government on religious issues. Um, originally educated down the road at Gombley Keys, and a member of the union himself, I've been told. Uh, what you see tonight on is a place to faith in Northern Britain. So, thank you very much, Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs. Uh, Laura, many thanks. It's a while since I spoke here, and this looks a pretty one-sided debate, so I'm going to take the vote. Uh, but friends, when, when I come back, a certain memory stays with me, so do forgive me if I've told this to you before, but the most memorable thing I ever learned at Cambridge was a story told to me, which I'm going to tell to you, and what its relevance is to this evening. To you, told to me by um, a wonderful man called David Dowler. Any of you study Roman law? You can't cross the name. He was Regis Professor of Roman law at Oxford, and I had invited him over to Cambridge to give a speech. And uh, I was first year undergraduate. He asked me what I was studying, and I said philosophy. And he said, "Oh dear, give that up immediately. The most useless thing you could ever do is study philosophy." Philosophers are entirely head in the clouds, and they have no idea what their wicked is. Give it up immediately. He said, I will illustrate this by telling you a story about your favorite philosopher. Now, anyone who studied philosophy in Cambridge in those days, hero worshipped Ludwig Wittgenstein. Any of you who studied Wittgenstein? You have wonderful this one. Do it this way. Okay. And he said, you know, uh, Wittgenstein, the great philosopher, was at the uh, Cambridge station waiting for the London train. And with him were two disciples, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, who subsequently was professor here at Cambridge, and uh, Professor H.L.A. Hart of Oxford. And of course, he said, they were so engrossed in their metaphysical conversations that they entirely failed to notice the train as it came into the station. They were still talking as people got off and people got on. And it was only as the train was leaving that they looked up and they saw the train was leaving. And he said, he was a Germanic guy, he said, and Professor Hart ran and he himself Enormous woman ran and heaved herself on board. And Wittgenstein, poor Wittgenstein, ran but could not catch up the train and was standing there as it steamed out of the station. He was looking so crestful that a woman who saw him said, came up to him and said, Don't worry, there will be another train in an hour's time. And he turned to her and said, But you don't understand, they came to see me off. <laughs> <laughs> now, what this has to do with the place of faith, in the modern world I have no idea, but it's telling you to start studying philosophy immediately. <laughs> However, there is a link. And the reason is that in effect, every self respecting European intellectual in the 18th and 19th century came to see religion off. There was almost not a single one of them who believed that religion could possibly survive in an enlightenment, rationalistic, scientific Europe. Laplace said, you know, Buzgoin de Saint-Pothès, I don't need God to explain the universe. Voltaire said, écrasé en femme. Nietzsche pronounced, God is dead. And uh, in the most beautiful British way, Matthew Arnold lamented the melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of the retreating tide of faith. And there it was. Everyone was convinced that religion was dead or dying and already 
in 1832, a very sharp observer, Alexis the Tolfrey, wrote the following words, having gone to America and amazed to find it, the very country that had instituted the separation of church and state, and going there as a Frenchman in 1832, discovers that it is an immensely religious society. And this is what he says in 1832. 18th century philosophers had a very simple explanation for the gradual weakening of beliefs. Religious zeal, they said, was bound to die down as enlightenment and freedom spread. It is tough that the facts do not fit this theory at all. Already in 1832, Tocqueville was amazed <coughs> to discover that religion survived. How much more so today? Work this out. Virtually every single function that religion once performed, it no longer performs. In order to explain the universe, we don't need to read the book of Genesis, we have science. In order to control nature, we don't need to pray, we have technology. If we want to generate wealth, we no longer need God's blessing, we have market economics, or we did once. And in order to deal with power, we do not need divinely appointed kings, we have liberal democracy. If you are ill, you don't go to a priest, you go to a doctor. If you feel guilty, you don't go to confession, you go to your psychotherapist. If you want exaltation of a religious kind, either a rock concert or go and watch Manchester United. <laughs> and if you seek salvation, you go to today's cathedrals, which are shopping centers, because you're worth it. And you work out. Every single function once done by, by religion is today done by something else. On the face of it, there is nothing left for faith to do. And yet today, believe it or not, there are more people, a higher percentage of the population, who go weekly to a place of worship in the United States than in Iran. That is an astonishing phenomenon. And what is more, religion, not only in the States, Today, in China, there are more Christians than members of the Communist Party. And we have just seen today a religiously inspired revolution, well, a partially religiously inspired revolution, bringing down the president of Egypt, just as a largely Catholic movement, Solidarity in Poland, helped bring down the Soviet Union. Our world is deep secularized. And the question is why? And the answer, it seems to me, is quite straightforward. The truth is that all the disciplines and all the institutions that we've constructed, science, technology, the market, economy, liberal, democratic politics, not one of them answers the three essential questions that any reflective human being will ask. Number one, why am I here? Number two, who am I? Number three, how then shall I live? Those questions are simply not answered by any academic discipline, by any modern institution, and they say. <coughs> the truth is, those questions are fundamental because each of us, to live and examine life, needs to find some meaning in life. And it is quite remarkable that, all the, that Sigmund Freud, who couldn't stand root, married an Orthodox Jewish woman and he wouldn't even let her keep a kosher home or like candles on church. Albert Einstein, who did not believe in a personal God, and none other than our friend Ludwig Wittgenstein, all said the same thing. Listen very carefully. 
This is what Sigmund Freud said. The idea of life having a purpose stands and falls with the religious system. Sigmund Freud. Albert Einstein. To know an answer to the question, what is the meaning of human life, means to be religious. Wittgenstein. To believe in God means to understand the question about the meaning of life. To believe in God means to see that the facts of the world are not the end of the matter. To believe in God means to see life as a meaning. So whether you believe in God or you don't, somehow or other, these thinkers from widely different perspectives concluded that religion stands or falls with the question of the meaning of, the meaning of life. And I just want to explain how I see what is involved here. We have two remarkable but very different facilities of the human mind. Number one, we have an ability to name things, to sort, to classify, to see how one thing is related to another, to break complex things into their constituent parts. That is the analytical mind. And the great achievements historically of the analytical mind were science and philosophy, both of which were born in ancient Greece in the 6th to 4th pre-Christian centuries. That is one remarkable capacity of the human mind. The second remarkable capacity is to do exactly the opposite. Not to break things into their component parts, but to join them together. To step back, to look at the universe as a whole, to look at history as a whole, to look at the human person as a moral agent, to look at human action not as the result of causes of a physical nature, but as a result of free choice, to see the human person not just as a body, but also a mind, a center of consciousness, and to see a human being acting not because X, Y, or Z causes operated on that person sometime previously, but because a human person decides to bring about a future that has not yet happened. To be able to see a human being as capable of not just being alone, but of feeling alone. All of those things have to do with, not with causal relationships, but with personal relationships. They involve not an analytical, but a synthesizing mind and those things have to do with the fact that we are not only beings who seek to explain, we are also meaning-seeking animals. Now those two functions of the mind correspond roughly, and I don't mean precisely, but roughly and metaphorically to the two hemispheres of the brain. The first one is a left brain activity. The left brain does science, does philosophy. That's what it does. It is analytical, sequential, detached. And there is a right brain that deals not with detachment, but with attachment. That doesn't theorize, it empathizes. It, the right brain, is what we use for our social skills, our personal relations. And there is, to my mind, roughly, the fundamental divide between religion and science. Here it is. Science takes things apart to see how they are. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. And we can no more do without both than we can do without. And that is, I believe, why religion survived and always will, because homo sapiens is the meaning-seeking animal. And we just cannot live without meaning. We cannot dispense without meaning. Now, it has been the great argument of scientific atheists that actually human life 
is meaningless. Here is a quote from Jacques Monod, the first, the precursor of the beloved Richard Dawkins. What would any of us do without Richard Dawkins? Here is Jacques Monod. Man must at last awake out of his millinery dream and discover his total solitude, his fundamental isolation. He must realize that, like a gypsy, he lives on the boundary of an alien world, a world that is deaf to his music, as indifferent to his hopes as it is to his sufferings or his crimes. He is Steve Weinberg, the Nobel Prize winning physicist. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems so you have a choice between scientific atheism, which insists on the meaninglessness of life, or religion that insists on the meaningfulness of life. And I don't believe that it is easy to decide between them. Let me explain. In my humble opinion, Dawkins, Hitchens and all the other guys, Jacques Mono, Steve Weinberg, are making totally unwarranted inferences. They are right when people think that science, or the left brain way of seeing things, is the only possible paradigm of human knowledge. And when you see that meaning doesn't fit the paradigm of science, the conclusion is there is no meaning. That is completely And you can see this very soon by realizing that the most important things for which we live, you and I live, are not susceptible to scientific proof. <coughs> trust, for instance, is one. Prove to me that you should trust people. Love is the mother. So is hope. So is honor. So is obligation. Philosophers have known since the time of Plato, for 24 centuries, that you cannot bring a proof that we should act moral. And yet, it does not follow that morality is meaningless. You cannot prove that it is right to trust people and to so act as to inspire trust in others. But it doesn't follow that we can live without trust. Manifestly, you cannot live without trust. What happened? in the last few days in Egypt is because people could no longer trust their leader. You cannot live without trust. Games theory has shown through the prisoner's dilemma that if you lack trust in one another and you then act rationally towards one another, you bring about outcomes that are bad for you and bad for everyone else. But in any given case, there is no logical reason why I should trust a stranger. And a society is a collection of strangers. So all the things on which we build meaningful lives are not susceptible of the kind of proof that speaks to the left brain, that speaks to the philosophical or the scientific mind, but that you can dispense with them is absolutely absurd. When the left brain sensibility tries to explain right brain phenomena, it can't. But it doesn't follow that those phenomena are illogical, irrational, or meaningless. To the contrary, the right brain is when meaning is formed and sustained, and it's how we make relationships of love and trust. Now, I want you to think very hard about a subject about which I know very little, which is football. Do me a favor. Um, help me out here. I'm here with, I'm here with uh, in, in, uh, naked and exposed as Marcel's support. I call for May I, may I share with you an interfaith article? I don't know if you heard this, but this happened some years ago when I had just been chosen to be chief rabbi and not taken up office yet. And George Carey had been chosen, you remember those Jurassic days, to be uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And somebody discovered that we were both manic Arsenal fans and said, Would you like your first ecumenical gathering? to be in our box in Highbury Stadium in those days. Well, I was down and it would be back from this theological reason. Well, we both came together on that sacred ground. <laughs> <laughs> Bloodlit match went out to the pitch to present a check to charity. I mean, the last of the announcements announced would be the Archbishop Gandhi, and you could 
hear the buzz around the ground, which is whichever way you play the theological wager. That night, Arsenal had friends. <laughs> they could not possibly lose. That night, you can look it up in the records and check, Arsenal went down to their worst home defeat. In 63 years, <laughs> they lost 6-2 at home to Manchester United. The next day, a national newspaper published the following news. It said, if the Archbishop of and the Chief Rabbi between them cannot bring about a win for Arsenal, does this not finally prove <laughs> that God does not exist? <laughs> the day after, I sent my reply, which was, no, it proves that God exists. It's just that he supports Manchester United. <laughs> so, friends, I want you to think about this. It's an Arsenal Manchester again. And you have a stranger who we are afraid of if there's anyone left in the entire universe who has never seen a football match. And you bring him along, and there it is, the high tension and all these strange things going around on the ground. Somebody from, I don't know, your anthropologist from Mars, whoever it is, E.T., whatever it is. And he wants to know what is going on here. Why is everyone getting so excited? Is this a religious ritual? And you explain to him all the rules of football. What's going on? What's it going on? What's offside? And this stranger, this alien, now knows all the rules of football. He still wants to know why are people getting so excited about which side gets a small spherical object in between three bits of wood? How come this is moving it? And I, how would we explain it? Yeah, I don't know, you know, they say to him, you know, we are hardwired for. Uh, Conflict, it's part of our tribal past, it's part of our hardwired in our brains, and nowadays instead of talking about how hard one another, we pay a lot of money to watch 22 footballers, not how hard one another. One way or another, you see the difference between explaining the rules of the game and explaining the meaning of the game. Do you, do you see the difference? You can know all the rules of the game, but you still can't work out why is this so amazing? From this, you will find a general rule, which I think you can apply to anything. And that is that the meaning of a system lies outside the system. Are you with me? You know, the meaning of how a, how a cash dispenser works is one thing. The meaning of what money is needs you to step outside of all of that and look at the whole business of barter exchange, Precious metals, etc., etc. The meaning of a system lies outside the system. The second you understand that, you will understand what was the breakthrough of Abrahamic monotheism. You see, normally we think the ancients worshipped a lot of gods, and along came monotheism and reduced them to one. It's a kind of mathematical reduction. Abrahamic monotheism wasn't that at all. The fact is that Abrahamic monotheism, for the first time, conceives of a God who transcends the universe, who stands outside everything. When the psalmist says, when I see the heavens, the work of your fingers, this is a revolution. God who transcends the universe. And that is why Abrahamic monotheism was the single most significant development in human culture, I believe. Because if the meaning of a system lies outside the system, then the meaning of the universe lies outside the universe. Abrahamic monotheism, for the first time, and I think the only time, showed that if God is beyond the universe, life has a meaning. And that, I believe, is what makes it so remarkable. You see, if you search the internet for the world's most influential person, 
you will come up with lots of lists on the internet. Missing from all of them is the person who actually wants the most influential person. A person who ruled no empire, who performed no miracle, who issued no prophecy, who had no mass of disciples, who did only one thing. He did the call of God to leave his land, his birthplace, and his father's house. Abraham and Sarah did nothing that we normally associate with changing the course of history. And yet today, more than half the people on the face of planet Earth claim to be directly or indirectly the spiritual disciples of Abraham. 2.2 2 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Muslims, and a few Jews, not many. And one way or time, the reason you cannot explain it in any other sense is that Abrahamic monotheism for the first time makes it possible for us to see that life has a meaning. Now, let me take these highly abstract thoughts and apply them to you. Here you are, about to go out into the world, about to begin a job, a career, who knows, a family. I want to ask a very simple question. For whom will you hold unconditional meaning? The people that you work for, the company that you work for may not exist one year after you choose. Jobs are no longer secure for life. Sadly, marriages are no longer <coughs> secure for life. The world is changing almost faster than we can bear. To an employer, you are a cost. To a politician, you are a vote. To an advertiser, you are a consumer. To a scientist, you are a bundle of chemicals. To whom do you matter unconditionally? Who would miss you if you aren't? And for help. We know we have significance in the aggregate. We know from Tunisia and from Egypt that you can start a demonstration by Facebook and a revolution by Twitter. We count in the mass if there are millions of us on the street. But whom do we count in our non substitutable individuality? To whom do we count? in unconditional love, in all our uniqueness, of all the meanings ever proposed for human life as a whole, I do not believe that there was ever one more simple or more beautiful than the idea that God created us, every one of us, in love and forgiveness and asks us to join Him in creating, in love and forgiveness. And the rest is coming. And it works. Show me a civilization that took seriously the views of Richard Dawkins or Steve Weinberg or Jacques Monod. Show me a civilization that sincerely believed that life is meaningless and I will show you a civilization beginning to decline and shortly thereafter to die. The two thinkers in antiquity who most agreed with everything that is said by today's scientific atheists were in 3rd century pre-Christian Greece, Epicurus, and in Rome, Lucretius, both of whom scientific materialists, both of whom were signs of the decline and shortly thereafter the fall of ancient Greece and ancient that is something on which all the great historians of civilization have agreed, whether it's Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century, or in the early 18th century, Gian Battista Vico, or in the 20th century, that great uh, master historian, Will Durant, who wrote, there is no significant example in history before our time of a society successfully maintaining moral life without the aid. This was a man who himself was not a religious believer. And now let me go just a little bit further. It has been my privilege 
to have been taught. I, I, it's the best ad, ad, education I could possibly have hoped for as a rabbi. I've had the privilege of being taught by or being friendly with serious atheists. Um, I uh, had the privilege of knowing quite well towards the end of his life by Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin said to me in our first conversation we had with him, Chief Rabbi, whatever you do, don't talk to me about religion when it comes to God. I'm tone deaf. And he said, what I don't understand is how you, you studied philosophy in Cambridge and in Oxford, how is it that you believe? And I said, Isaiah, if this helps, think of me as a lapsed parrot. <laughs> quite understandable, quite understandable. Isaiah Berlin, I had the great privilege of knowing that wonderful anti-religious uh, novelist in Israel, Anos Oz, uh, with him we did a... Uh, conversation together in which uh, began the public dialogue together which we did in a university in Israel with the sentence, I don't think I'm going to agree with Rabbi Sachs on everything, but mind you on most things I don't agree with myself. Uh, there's a wonderful atheist in America, I don't know if you've come across him, the Harvard neuroscientist Stephen Pinker. Have you come across Stephen? Stephen um, was in our house about nine months ago, I said, Stephen, does an atheist need a prayer? So he said, of course, Stephen, an atheist needs a prayer. Book. So I gave him a copy of my prayer book. And uh, I was trying to work out why, and I think probably, I hope Stephen will forgive me, uh, Stephen has a view about religion, like the story about Niels Bohr, you know, the Nobel Prize winning physicist. You know that Niels Bohr apparently had over the front door of his house a horseshoe. And a friend of his was visiting and said, Neil, you can't. Neil, you can't believe in that. And Neil said, of course I don't. But the thing is, it works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've read, Stephen, Stephen has a wife, a philosopher, and a novelist called Rebecca Goldstein. I don't know if you've seen her book. It's just come out in paperback called 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, subtitled a work of fiction. And, uh, and Rebecca has just been elected by the American Humanist Society as Humanist of the Year 2011. So I emailed Rebecca and I said, you know, congratulations, muzzle I said, you've just been elected His Majesty's loyal opposition. And she sent me back an email, I quote, how kind of you, this leader of his stroke, her uh, Majesty's Loyal opposition is so very loyal that sometimes she wonders whether she's in the opposition at all. So he's a great, tremendous atheist, and I love them all. And uh, they're all Jewish, and you probably wrote this one out. That we do a really good line in atheists. <laughs> uh, in fact, three of the four great atheists of the modern world were Jewish, Spinoza, Marx, and Freud. The only one who wasn't Jewish was Darwin. Why Darwin wasn't Jewish, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Long beard, total heretic. It must have been random genetic mutation. <laughs> <laughs> However, the truth is that I personally, and I share with you, I've never said this in public before, that I personally discovered the meaning of faith from a non Jewish atheist, a remarkable mind, and that was a philosopher of the late Sir Bernard Williams. I don't know if you've read uh, any philosophers here. Bernard Williams was uh, professor of philosophy and provost of King's College, Cambridge, and Bernard, who was a lapsed Catholic and a passionate atheist, and described as the cleverest man in England, <coughs> and undeniably the um, the greatest moral philosopher of his age, and Bernard was my doctoral supervisor. And I want you to, ex I just want to explain to you how I learned the meaning of faith from Bernard Williams. Bernard Williams was very interested in a concept called moral luck. He wrote a book called Moral Luck. He believed that there was such a thing as luck in morality. Why this should matter 
it's a bit technical, but it was his way of refuting the Kantian approach to ethics. Anyway, one way or another, he developed the following argument. It was about, and he gave it as an example, just as a hypothetical example, but it's an interesting one. The uh, painter um, Gauguin. Gauguin, as you probably know, uh, was a uh, stockbroker in Paris, married with five children, who decided in the mid-1880s just to walk away, to leave his family, his job, his responsibilities, and pursue his art. He began, he spent some weeks painting with Van Gogh in Arles, and then, of course, he went to the South Pacific, to Tahiti, and there he uh, developed his art. Bernard Williams asked the following question. What made that choice a justified choice? Are you with me? What makes us think, in retrospect, that Gauguin was justified in leaving his family and going to the South Pacific? And Williams took the view, I don't know if you share it, that what made it justified was that he was a genius. He may have created indelible masterpieces. But, said Williams, there was no way he could have known that when he made the choice to leave Paris and go to the South Pacific. Does that make sense to you? That we, we kind of feel sympathetic to him because life would have been impoverished without good. So, it turned out to be a matter of moral luck because he couldn't have known in advance that he was an artistic genius until he had tried. And therefore he concluded there is such a thing as moral luck. Now I believe that that argument doesn't make sense at all in the terms in which Williams framed it. The truth is there's a fundamental difference between our aesthetic judgment of Gauguin and our moral judgment of Gauguin. There's Gauguin considered as an artist and Gauguin considered as a human being. And it could be that Gauguin was a brilliant artist but a thoroughly separate human being. And the first, that he was a great artist, turns out to have been a matter of luck. But the second, that he walked out on his wife and children, is got nothing to do with luck at all. That has to do with his choice, and we can be critical of that choice. However, so I didn't agree with his analysis. However, it did make enormous sense to me if we took it in a different direction. Because what did Gauguin have? Gauguin had faith. He had faith not in God, but faith in himself, in his art, and in his gift. And now, for the first time, you can see what faith actually is. It is not believing six impossible things before breakfast. It is not believing that Genesis 1 is literally true. Faith is the ability to make a commitment on the basis of something we cannot know in advance. It is the willingness to take the risk of setting out on a journey not knowing whether you will ever reach your destination. Faith is a commitment, total, existential, and transformative, and it will always involve risk. And in that sense, it takes faith to get married. It takes faith to have a child. It takes faith to start a business. It takes faith to write a novel. It takes faith to begin a research project. It takes faith to start out on a journey to a destination that you cannot know until you reach it. And that is what Abraham did. He had a voice saying, leave your house or your land, your father's house, and go to the land which I will show you. It is what Moses and the Israelites did when they set out across the desert in search of a distant promise. It is what the prophet Jeremiah says when he says, I remember the kindness of you how you were willing to follow me through an unknown, unsung land. Faith has to do with an attitude, part courage, part trust, that we adopt as free agents as we face an unknown and constitutively unknowable future. And religious faith is the willingness to take that risk 
in the belief that there is something, some force, some presence, some thou that answers to that trust. And Bernard Williams helped me to understand how it is that faith is neither rational nor irrational. It's something else. It's something like what Gauguin did with this one difference that Gauguin had faith in his life, that one life, but religious faith is to extend that faith to life as a whole. Human <coughs> and that is what faith is. And it is completely untouched by any of the arguments you have ever heard, by any rational, philosophical, or scientific atheists. And without that faith, I cannot see how life is meaningful and a meaningless life cannot be lived. I just end with one very, very simple thought. This was, there comes a point where dumbing down intellectually gives dumbing down a bad name. Do you remember the British Humanist Association's bus version? Do you remember reading about those at the beginning of 2009? British Humanist Association hired ads on London buses saying, probably, what is it, God? Probably doesn't exist. Now, this, I, I love this. I love this stuff. Isn't this seriously wonderful? God probably doesn't exist. Well, you know what? They're probably right. But I cannot think of anything more boring than being probable. Just work out. How probable is it that this entire universe, 13.7 billion light years across, was able to satisfy those six mathematical constants which Lord Rees, still master of Trinity College, Cambridge, yes. still president of the Royal Society, if you've read his book, Just Six Numbers, or any of his similar books, you know that the universe is so precisely due to be what it is, to support planets and stars and all the rest of it, that it is so improbable that the only way Stephen Hawking in his recent book, Lord Rees himself and so on, is able to explain it, is by saying the only reason we can justify the universe existing is if there were an infinite number of parallel universes, so one of them struck by you. How probable is that? Number two. Imagine you forget all those improbabilities and it's just natural that this universe exists. How probable is it that out of 100 billion galaxies, each on average of 100 billion stars, there is only one heavenly body that we know of at all capable of sustaining life and that is planet Earth. Today, the president of Harvard, Howard Smith, senior astrophysicist at Harvard University, announced that out of the 500 planets thus far discovered, 499 of them are hostile to life. Guys, if you wanted friends out there, you may have to wait a little longer. How probable is it that out of all these hundreds of billions, one would be capable of sustaining life? Number three, supposing you take the existence of the universe and the existence of Earth for granted, how probable is it that non-life could become life? Francis Crick, a wonderfully pure atheist, thought it was so improbable that he had to insist that life was probably came here from Mars on a meteorite, thus making another improbability. Now let us suppose that life actually exists. How probable is it that life developed sentience such that you could invent things like the Cambridge Union without any evil? advantage whatsoever. Friends, how probable is it that a people as tiny as the Jews, you know how many Jews there are? 13.2 million. Yeah. <laughs> as somebody memorably said, equal to the statistical error in the Chinese census. Now, how probable is it that this people numbering 0.2 of a percent of the population of the world should have been assaulted by virtually every major empire there ever was, each of which seemed impregnable and invulnerable in its time, from Egypt to Assyria to Babylonia to the Greeks to the Romans to the medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, all the way 
to the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, and every one of those civilizations is consigned to history and to museums, and this time people still live. How probable is it that a tiny persecuted sect called Christianity would one day become the biggest movement of any kind in the history of the world? How probable is it, here's my favorite improbability, that the inventor of probability theory, the greatest mathematician of his age, would at the age of 30 give up mathematics completely and devote the rest of his life to religion. He was Blaise Pascal. Nothing interesting in the universe is probable. And therefore, I have to conclude that probably God doesn't exist, or to put it another way, improbably he does. Friends, quite simply, it is wildly improbable that ancient kings, with all their power, would disappear, while ancient prophets, with no power at all, would continue to inspire us to this day. It is wildly impossible, improbable, that the vision of a world structured by justice and compassion, in which, in the words of Isaiah, we might aspire to a situation in which nation does not lift up sword against nation, in which we believe that every human being, regardless of class or color or culture or creed, is in the image and likeness of God. How wildly improbable that such crazy ideas would ever inspire human beings. And someday, in some way, come true. Friends, faith is the defeat of probability by the power of possibility. By dreaming the possible, the people of faith in history have made life meaningful. Is faith Still relevant today, it is, as it ever was, as it ever will. Thank you for listening.
you can have a civilization, but it, it's not based on a religious belief. It could be, you know, what we would call wisdom tradition, powers of tradition. Or you can have a religion based on a polytheistic hierarchical system, great chain of being, as Egypt was, as Mesopotamia was, and so on. So, um, it seems to me that Abrahamic faith has given rise to these three civilizations, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that have shaped a particular kind of civilization. And that was not the civilization, I have to admit it, of people I admire hugely, like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Um, it seems to me, I do not argue that there can be a knockdown I really don't because Vernon Williams, my supervisor man, I hugely admired, took an entirely different view of life, which I understood and respected for its consistency and indeed its depth. And in the end, the best way I could put it is that if you truly believe as he truly believed, as Nietzsche truly believed, that life really is meaningless then you settle for a very real tradition in the West, what I call the tragic view of life. Whereas the Abrahamic faith is the view of life which I call the principal defeat of tragedy in the name of hope. So you can have hope tragedies, uh, hope cultures. You can have tragic cultures. You can have wisdom cultures. And I profoundly believe as a Jew that I am not called on to convert the world. I profoundly believe Because I believe there are other ways, and I believe that wisdom is a tradition all of its own. That's, after all, the tradition that is represented in the Hebrew Bible by books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job. I think it was large minded if you were to canonize the Bible, that they included such deeply subversive books which really stand outside. I mean, there's no way that, I mean, I, 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 I don't think necessarily they would have voted the author of Ecclesiastes as my successor as chief rabbi. Would that be fairly true? Because many of his beliefs are irrelevant. So I think there is a congruence between religious faith and the kind of society that we've created in the West. Um, but I think you can have other kinds of society. And I think our faith has to be generous enough to make space for those who see the world. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask two questions? Can I ask two questions? Please. <coughs> the first is, 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 do you think that the Enlightenment was an inevitable sense of development or is it radical enlightenment a uniquely European phenomenon. I, I honestly don't know. I, I just don't know. Anyone know? <laughs> it's a great question. I just, you know, I mean, you, you have to say not only what, what radical enlightenment was, but what was it dialectically set against, you know. And, um, you know, it seems to me that it, it is a, pro a, a reaction <coughs> against a certain kind of religiosity. Um, I think, and I'll be blunt with you, I believe that Europe became secular. Not because people stopped believing in God. After all, the two heroes of the Enlightenment, Descartes and Newton, believed in God very much. I think they became secular because they lost faith in the ability of people of God to live peaceably with one another. 
I think it is no accident whatsoever that the Enlightenment emerged in the wake of the European wars of religion in the 16th and early 17th century. So it seems to me that Enlightenment is a specific reaction against um, people of religion killing one another. People of the same religion killing one another. Because, you know, you didn't get Enlightenment as a reaction against the Crusades. Christians against Muslims, Muslims against Christians. But when it was Christians killing Christians, that is when the sincere Christians said, we have to find a foundation of knowledge that does not depend on dogmatic assumptions. That is how Stephen Toulmin uh, argues in Cosmopolis, which is one way of reading the mind. The second question was what? Oh, uh, religion's a protest of tragedy. Well, if you think the protest is bound to fail, yes. Uh, no, I mean, Judaism, we don't think, you know, they're going to fail. The most miserable prophet of the entire lot, Jeremiah, was also the most eloquent prophet of hope. Um, no, as, you know, I've made this distinction in many of my books, I just make it again for you. There is a tendency to confuse optimism and hope. And optimism and hope, which sounds so similar, are actually very different. An optimist believes things are going to get better. Somebody with hope believes that if we work hard enough together, we may make things better. It takes no courage, only a certain naivety, to be an optimist. But it takes a great deal of courage to have. No Jew knowing what we do of history can be an optimist. But Jews don't give up. So that's how I draw that distinction. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I just end off with a story. I mean, it's, it's, 
true story. It's an interesting story. Um, in 1997, I published a book on the politics of hope, in which I developed a political philosophy a little different from Isaiah Berlin in his famous 1957 lecture, Two Concepts of Liberty, very famous essay. So it was 40 years on, and I felt that whereas Isaiah Berlin was right for his time, the big danger to freedom was totalitarianism, whereas in 1997 I thought the big danger to freedom was the internal erosion of the sense of moral community in the societies of the West. And I asked Isaiah, to, would he read the book? Because I was very interested to know what his reaction was. So I sent him the book. I didn't hear from him for a, a number of and after a while, you know, towards the end of 97, I thought, you know, I'd like to know what Isaiah thinks. And I found out his home had been to know just outside Oxford. And his wife immediately answered the phone. She said, oh, Chief Rama, Isaiah has just been talking about it. Now, I guarantee you, Chief Rama is not the normal subject of Isaiah Berlin's conversation. So I said to her, in what context? And she said, Isaiah has just asked whether you would officiate at his funeral. I said, Papa, pa, pa, which my brother from Russia said, I had to explain this is not a particular kind of box with degree like PPE. And I said, you know, to banish the uh, evil inclination or uh, the evil eye on someone's opening, I said, that let him think in such terms as morbid thought to have, but clearly he knew. Because four days later he died. And I officiated him at his funeral. His biographer, um, what's his name? Um, Ignatiev. What? Michael Ignatiev. Michael Ignatiev was fascinated by this. He came around to see me and he said, You know, Isaiah was a secular Jew. Why did he want to be buried by a Jew? And I said to him, Isaiah may not have been a believing Jew, but he was a loyal Jew. And that is what I mean. So I am Jewish because of covenant means loyalty. And this is our particular way of relating to the universal God, without denying that other people have a different relationship. May your relationship with God be great. May his with you be even greater. Thank you for listening, and I wish you every success in all you do.